Okay, so uh, you might know our next speaker as the author of the book Sustainable Web Design or as the lead author of the Sustainable Web Manifesto. His name is Tom Greenwood and he's here to talk about web design for people and planets. Tom, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will uh, bring my slides up. Uh, good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to give you a short talk on web design for people and planet. Um, those of you attending may may well be aware that the internet has significant emissions. We often talk about the internet as being something that is in the cloud, that is virtual, it doesn't really have any material presence or existence. Um, but it is a very physical system. And when it's all added up, all of the data centers, the networks, the end user devices, then the internet actually consumes a huge amount of electricity and produces a large amount of emissions, roughly equivalent in annual carbon emissions to the country of Germany, which is one of the largest polluters in the world, um, and also similar in annual emissions to global aviation, which obviously is a, an industry that is a, a focus of um, climate change action, and there's a lot of public awareness around the impact of flying on uh, global warming, but there's very little awareness around the impact of ICT and the internet. And the emissions from the internet essentially come from the energy used in the manufacture and operation of three things. So data centers, transmission networks to send the data around the globe from the data centers to the end users and back again, and the end user devices. So the billions of smartphones, laptops, desktop computers, smart TVs, and increasingly the internet of things, the large number of connected devices such as Amazon Alexa, connected cars, connected fridges, etc. So these are the three places where we can where we're consuming energy. There are also the three places where we can save energy. So we can save energy in web design um, by reducing server load, by reducing the amount of data transferred through the networks, and by reducing the energy used on end users' devices when they are accessing our websites or accessing our web applications. And when we do this, we'll achieve a number of benefits. The first will be an environmental benefit through reduced energy usage, but we'll also achieve improved performance. So we'll make our applications and our websites faster, which is something that is good for business, but also good for user experience. And we'll also improve the experience for the people accessing our websites and applications, uh, both through the improved performance, but also through other uh, user experience benefits. So what can we actually do to achieve this reduced energy consumption and the other benefits that go with it? So the first thing that we can do might seem sort of like it has nothing to do with energy consumption, um, but it's simply to streamline user journeys. So the more time that people spend trying to find what the information that they're looking for on the internet, um, the more time that they spend looking in the wrong place, visiting multiple pages of a website that don't have the information that they need, the more energy is being consumed, both through the time they're spending um, actually on their devices, but also through the amount of data that has to be loaded through that person accessing multiple pages and loading data that's not useful to them. So when we focus on really, really good user experience and try to streamline user journeys, eliminate dead ends in those user journeys and get people to their destination as efficiently and as easily as possible, we're actually helping them as a user, but we're also saving energy and reducing carbon emissions. So this is a win-win for, for the user, for the environment, and if it's a, a commercial website, then it's also um, commercially a good thing. And the example on the screen is, is a nice example of Finisterre e-commerce website, which has an Ajax shopping cart that is always available on every page. So the user doesn't have to keep 
clicking through to a shopping cart page to remember what they put in their cart and then skip back to the page that they were on and then forget where they were in their journey. Their, their cart is visible to them at all times, meaning they don't have to do this uh, back and forth in their user journey, which, which saves, saves data, saves energy and saves some time. So let's assume that we've streamlined our user journeys, we've planned the website efficiently. We now need to look at the actual details of the design to see how efficient we can make them. And one of the key things on any website or any web application that's going to have a big impact is images. So images tend to be the main uh, consumer of data on most websites. And so simply starting from the point of view of saying how can we use less in, less images less photography uh in particular photos uh high have large file sizes so thinking in the design process about how we can create a brand experience uh communicate the information we're trying to communicate with less photographs will have a benefit on performance and on energy consumption um, and some alternatives we can use to photography are vector imagery um, such as SVG files and CSS. So just CSS styles, CSS shapes can, can be very, very efficient, um, but create uh, a dramatic effect. Um, the example on the page, the Rights for Children website is, um, it's a fun, colorful website for children, um, but it doesn't use any photography. So it's super fast, um, uses minimal data. And this is good for the user as well, because it means that it's not consuming their limited data, especially mobile data. Um, and then the photo, when we do use photography, we really want to optimize that as far as possible. So here's just one quick example. This photograph of a horse who lives me, near me in England in, in the New Forest. Um, this photograph is full screen. It's 1.2 megabytes. If we were to put this on a website at the size um, that it is on the screen as a JPEG file. But if we halve its pixel dimensions, we actually reduce it from 1.2 megabytes to 360 kilobytes. So it's a huge saving in data. And we could incorporate this into a design in a way that may have just as much informational benefit, just as much emotional attachment. Um, it may even be easier uh, to, to read because we could put text next to it on the page, whereas the full screen image is difficult to uh, combine the text in an accessible way. So we've got a huge benefit in terms of file size, performance, and uh, potentially user experience as well. But if we look at the image on the right, it's the same image, but the edges of the image are blurred and only the horse is in focus. And this is nearly halved the file size again, down to 192 kilobytes. And it's simply because the detail in an image is basically proportional to the amount of data in the image. So when you reduce detail, you actually reduce the file size. So actually thinking about art direction, so shallow depth of field in photography or creative styles in uh, imagery that reduce the amount of data, but in a way that looks good, um, can actually really help reduce file sizes. And one additional element of that is actually just reducing color detail um, also reduces the file size. So the black and white photograph is actually even smaller, it's 129 kilobytes, which is 10% of the original full screen color image that I showed you as a JPEG file. Um, and that's before we even talk about alternative file sizes, so file types. So if we were going to put this on a website, JPEG might be the default, but actually we would want to load it as WebP in browsers that support it, which would make the file even smaller. Um, and in the future, ABIF, which is a new file format, which should be supported by many browsers very, very soon. So that's images, but what if we're using video? Most websites don't necessarily use video in a large way, but those that do um, consume a huge amount of data. And the single, uh, the single biggest source of data consumption on some websites is autoplay video, where you have a video that plays in the background automatically as soon as somebody visits that website. So this is a really easy win in terms of saving energy, um, is just to avoid autoplay video at all costs. It tends to be, um, it tends to, it's can significantly slow down a website, which is poor for user experience. It's uh, bad for SEO and conversion rates. 
It's also bad for the user in terms of consuming their data without their permission. So they load a web page and before they even know what's happening, you're actually burning through their data allowance. Um, so for people who don't have unlimited data, autoplay video can, can be uh, an unfair penalty on them as a user. Um, so avoiding autoplay video has benefits both for the environment commercially and for the user. And then we can do other things such as compress our video files, stream at the lowest definition that we think we can get away with. We don't need everything in HD or ultra high definition. Um, and obviously reducing the time, the length of a video will also reduce the amount of data consumed. We can also look at alternatives to video. So interactive animations such as the one uh, loading on the screen here can actually be better than video to communicate factual information. So you can actually have um, an interactive animation using a library such as Lottie, which is an open source library. And they consume a lot less data than a video. They're SEO friendly because the text on the page is real text. Um, that also means that they're more accessible. So people with screen readers can actually read the content because it's, it's real text on the page. And the timeline is controllable. So the user can actually skip through the stages of the animation at their own pace which is better for learning, uh, makes it easier for them to find the information they're looking for than a video where they have to watch the whole video to find out whether it contains the information that they want. So we've, we've looked at user journeys, images and videos. So what about, what about fonts? So fonts are an interesting one because they're not talked about that much, but actually they can have quite a big impact um, on data consumption. So there's system fonts, or so the fonts that come with all devices. Um, so things like Arial times New Roman um, are on devices by default. Roboto is the font, uh, one of the fonts on Android devices by default. Using system fonts is um, means that no, no font files have to be loaded when somebody visits that web page, which is really good for performance, really good for the environment. Um, but the downside of that is that system fonts can look quite old fashioned. They are um, not necessarily very popular from a design point of view, but we can optimize our custom fonts um, by making sure that we use the most efficient file format, which is WAF2. Um, that we subset fonts. So you can actually go online and Google for uh, a free tool, uh, just Google for font subsetting tool, and you'll find a selection of tools that will basically strip out all of the characters that you don't need. So an example of this in the table below uh, is the font into UI, which is an open source font, by default comes with 2,192 characters. Um, that's a lot of characters and most languages have far fewer. If we, if we subset the font to only contain the characters in English and French, we end up with 98 characters. Um, and if we do that as well as convert the file from TTF to WAF2 format, we reduce the size of one font file from 300 kilobytes to 700 kil so to seven kilobytes, which is, which is a huge saving. So we can do that for uh, any custom font um, and, and obviously using fewer font weights is also good because uh, many custom fonts require us to load a separate file for each different weight. So for standard weight, bold, light, italic, um, some fonts will require separate files for each of those. So the fewer weights we use in our designs, uh, the less data has to be loaded and the faster the site will load. Um, we should also look at the colors we use. Um, this is only relevant on OLED screens, which is the sort of modern screen technology used on most smartphones, uh, tablets, uh, an increasing number of laptops and smart TVs, where each pixel is an, is an individual light bulb. And what this means is that uh, when we use white, we're using the most amount of energy and because all of the light bulbs have to light up at full brightness. When we use black, um, almost no energy is consumed because the pixels are actually switched off. Um, so using darker colors in general in our designs is going to reduce energy consumption on the end user's device, which is also good for the user if they're on a mobile device because it will help save battery and therefore the battery will last longer. We should also try to 
track our users less. This has obviously got a, there's obviously many privacy issues associated with um, tracking scripts, but there's also an environmental penalty. So when we, when we track users, we have to do multiple things. We have to load the tracking scripts, which means increased data consumption. The tracking scripts are then performing work on the end user's device, which is consuming energy on their device and reducing their battery life. They then have to send the data back to the data center, which is again increasing data consumption. And then that data has to be stored and often it's stored indefinitely on in the data center. So energy is being used in multiple additional ways when we're tracking. So in addition to the privacy issues, um, when we reduce tracking, we're also reducing energy consumption and we're also improving user experience by minimizing the need for unpleasant uh, and complicated cookie notices, such as the one on the screen here on the Bloomberg website. If we have a choice, we can also look at using more efficient coding languages. So some coding languages are far more energy efficient than others to perform the same types of tasks. So the most efficient programming languages um, are C, Rust and C++, and the least efficient are Perl, Python and Ruby. Um, now in, in web design, we're tending to use mostly uh, PHP, Ruby and, and JavaScript. Out of those, JavaScript is significantly more efficient than PHP and Ruby, it's seven times more efficient, energy efficient than PHP, and 16 times more energy efficient than Ruby. So we can, if we have a choice, which we don't always have a choice, but if we have a choice, then moving to JavaScript or another um, highly energy efficient language is going to be um, a good thing in the future. And one additional thing that I want to mention is the concept of drugging the user. So increasingly web applications are used to make the user want to keep coming back. So, and, and we use terms in web design such as making an application sticky from a user experience point of view. But sticky really just means that you're trying to make the user addicted to the service. So this is things like infinite scroll, um, uh, giving uh, feedback to users through like notifications that make them feel like they've got a reward that they want to keep coming back. So we need to think really carefully about the way that we design our applications to make sure that we're not um, designing in addictive features because addictive features are bad for mental health, um, but they're also bad for the environment because we're encouraging mindless, un, unwanted and unnecessary consumption of, of data and of web services, which consumes more energy. And so it's, it's, it might be good commercially if you're an app developer, uh, but it's not good for society. It's not good for the environment. And just to highlight a few, um, a few resources that you, that may be useful if you're exploring, uh, sort of more sustainable ways of designing websites. So the first is websitecarbon.com, which is a carbon calculator for websites that you can put any uh, any web address into and get an estimate of the carbon emissions of that page. There's a new version of this is going to be launched, hopefully within a, a few months, which will have new data um, and slightly slightly more information about where the energy is being used. Um, the Safari browser has a really good tool that I recommend looking at, which is the energy impact tool. Um, so in Safari, if you go to developer tools, um, you'll see in the middle of this image on the right hand side, there's a green, yellow and red bar, um, which shows the energy impact. And you can use this on any web page to find out how much CPU energy is being used on the end user's device when they load that web page. And then what you can do as a designer or a developer is you can experiment with different effects, particularly um, animation effects. So if you're using JavaScript for animation and your web page, um, some animation effects are very CPU intensive and some of them are very efficient. So you can experiment with different effects and test the energy impact and then find effects that uh, provide a good user experience, but also use minimal amount of energy. Um, and finally, as was mentioned at the beginning, um, I've written a book, Sustainable Web Design, uh, which you can you, which you can buy online and contains 
a lot more information than I can cover here in 20 minutes, uh, but hopefully is useful to you in exploring uh, sustainability within your web projects. Thank you very much.